Islamophobia, or fear-mongering based on anti-Muslim hate, is a prevailing characteristic of current U.S. culture. Its impact, which includes increased surveillance and profiling, is devastating as significant portions of the public are moved to embrace an exclusivist worldview. And that undermines our ideal for a just, tolerant, loving, and pluralistic society. 47% of Americans believe Muslims should wear an identity. 47%. This has been going on for many years, post 9-11, and the numbers just keep increasing. Islamophobia is not just, oh, I don't like you because you're different, or oh, you, I don't understand you because you wear the thing on your head. Islamophobia is a deliberate, political, structural problem that is being put forth to distract us from understanding what the United States is actually doing in the Middle East and in Southeast Asia, right? It is walking down the street not knowing what will happen. It is trying to explain to children why it is going on. It is not understanding it yourself even though you spent decades of your life working on it educating people to just confront the same wall again. So one of the things I'd like to acknowledge is that it's painful. I'm everything that uh, um, uh, the white supremacist structure abhors, right? So I'm black, I'm female, I'm Muslim, I'm queer. So everything that's offensive um, to white supremacy, I am that thing, right? And so I have to decide what am I going to do with, with being, um, being projected as a problem. There's the overt expressions of Islamophobia and anti-Muslim sentiment, and there's the overt actions, and there's the overt violence, but there is also the systematic and hidden and supposedly invisible Islamophobia. And in my experience as an educator and a professor, those are sometimes the harder ones to root out. I do not remember a time in my religious development where there was not Islamophobia. There was just not a word for Islamophobia. It's been around for a long time. And even before my day, it started to develop in the civil rights movement when the, the nation of Islam started to come into the news and Muslims were scary black people who were going to take over the country. And I would encourage us to consider that really in the white American unconscious, that's still what's going on. So there's a very strong connection between the fear of people of color and the fear of Muslims, which is at the core of, of our problems as a nation. So in, in the ways that we you know, would, would combat misogyny, we also realize that it's all connected, that um, FOR has also prioritized the movement for black lives. As we address Islamophobia and um, the Syrian refugee crisis and the crisis in Israel-Palestine, these, these struggles for justice are connected because we are, our oppression and our freedom are intimately intertwined. We, we were part of uh, Communities United for Police Reform, which is an amazing coalition of organizations, many of them faith-based, and, and, and this was the coalition that was instrumental in um, catapulting the uh, Floyd case with the Center for Constitutional Rights um, in, uh, in, in what culminated in, uh, the ultimate, uh, in, the ultimate, in the ultimate ruling by Judge Shinlin, uh, where she basically wrote that the stop and frisk practices of, of Mayor Bloomberg and Ray Kelly were unconstitutional. She struck down uh, what they were doing. And that's, I mean, that's unprecedented in the history of America. As the media often portrays the evil side of Islam, rather than the 1.6 billion people that are there, and I think for me, this is actually the best thing to do, is to simply do the best I can in other areas, such as the environmental justice arena, or the mass incarceration arena, or the Black Lives Matter arena. Things 
that are outside the Muslim arena to show what it is to be a Muslim and have my message of Islam be relayed through my work and to, sh to show how our, our movements are all intertwined with each other. And I think for me that's the best way to do it, to be in political action in solidarity. Because Islamophobia is a big problem for me, but it's also the last in a line of continuous struggles in this country. And what I like best are the questions for teachers and parents. And the final question, which says, can you name another religious tradition that has many different groups within it? In other words, why do we think that all Muslims are the same, but all these other groups that we know are not? Empathy is one of the things that we have to tackle. I live in Atlanta, um, is I'm a, I'm a teacher. And so with so much um, Islamophobic rhetoric happening, happening around me, as a teacher and as an educator, I can introduce Islamophilic conversations and have conversations with, with young folks about, um, about Muslims in history and about Muslim identity and how people who are doing great things also happen to be Muslim because Muslim identities are also, are like, are like all of the US American identities. They're multivalent. There's a term called spiritual envy that was coined by Judith Burling. One of my spiritual envies is Eid and Iftars. We, you know, we, we, we Christians should be celebrating Advent in a month-long kind of way, but uh, you know it, it doesn't happen, and it's certainly not at the same community level with um, comings together each evening. And so I think offering those particular um, particularities of other faiths um, and the desire to be to inhabit that, to be other, even though I'm I'm not of that tradition. Um, helps people to get outside of the, um, the rigid and reified narratives that are out there. Everything I write is fodder for someone who wants something else to use against Islam. I don't write it from that standpoint. I write it as a critical lover of the tradition who wants to see it move forward. But it will be used in horrid ways and when people are trying to hold communities together and hold on to tradition, they will circle the wagons and say, don't come talking to us about change. Don't. When you want to religiously inform people of their own, um, you know, their own uh, wrong actions and their own wrong sentiments about women being leaders in the community, you have to back it up with religious statements. Like, for example, like, you know, to point one out, one out with the, um, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his, um, peace be upon him, his, wife, Aisha, um, after he passed away, um, she was the one leader of the community that passed along the messages of the prophets to the rest of the community. She was that person that gave people advice about what the prophet said because she was very closely connected to him. And I think it's important to point out that we had those leaders at one point and, you know, she was one of the main leaders after he passed away and he did that on purpose so that she could be one of those um, important people that people refer to for religious advice. Faith-based institutions in this city, which are largely run and almost exclusively run by, by men, from a different generation, from a different culture, the stretch, it seems to me, that Muslim women are having to do right now in public life in the city is, it's just not an easy thing. That's all I'm saying. And I'm wondering practically, how do you actually bridge that extraordinary gap that still exists? I think that Muslims need to address the issue of misogyny and the various human rights issues within the context of Islam. Because when we receive these threads, uh, these chain letters that get sent around that promotes Islamophobia, anti-Islam, anti-Muslim sentiment, all they do is literally cut and paste from the conservative and radical narratives. The truth be told, there are very few, very few American imams that step forward in addressing misogyny within uh, the context of Islam. In my view, our two greatest um, drawbacks in community are A, not sharing with each other, and B, not sharing with the outside world. Our business is generosity. We need to display more of that. And in order to do that, we need to strengthen each other in this work.
One of the bills that we at FCNL worked on with over a hundred other national organizations um, was uh, uh, introduced by Representative Don Beyer of Virginia. It's called the Freedom of Religion Act. It was a very simple bill um, that essentially would um, change the Immigration Nationality Act to prohibit denying admission to anyone to the U.S. based on their re religion. Um, it's, again, very simple piece of legislation that was introduced in response to the hateful rhetoric by Donald Trump's proposed Muslim ban. In terms of how we think of our work, we really want to be um, principled partners in this work, accountable to a broader movement led by those who've been directly impacted by Islamophobia, anti-racism, and, and all forms of, of, of racism and injustice. And at the same time, we want to hold our own community accountable and to really do that work inside our community. It's unfortunately, something we have to do annually is to pass a provision in one of the end of the year spending bills, which is generally the Department of Homeland Security appropriates bill, um, to add a provision in there that says none of the funding um, used for these counterterrorism programs should support no bigoted, uh, it should support any sort of program that would, um, would be profiling, right? I think what we have in this country is uh, we have teachers who are not prepared to teach about difference. They are professionals, they are highly educated, they, many of them are creative, but they are not trained to teach about the multiple different identities people have, their intersectionality, uh, stereotyping, demonizing, um, and phenomena like Islamophobia. It should be required as part of their ongoing education as well, their professional development, and they should be judged on that and held accountable. We will not be silent about anti-Muslim and racist hate speech and hate crimes. We fight anti-Muslim profiling and racial profiling in all its forms. We stand against U.S. policies driven by the, quote, war on terror. We challenge through our words and actions institutionalized racism and state-sanctioned anti-black violence. It's is interfaith um, disaster relief. It's interfaith climate justice movements, the climate march. It's the interfaith movement to combat you know, racism. It's the Black Lives Matter. It's helping the indigenous communities. It's the interfaith organizing for Syria. Only through those have I really gotten a head start in policy making and lobbying with my interfaith brothers and sisters and changing policy. And, but, but because I've had to be grounded in my faith, they've helped me ground my faith, my interfaith partners, and I hope I've helped them with their, with their faith journey as well. I've had a beautiful experience. I really believe in the American um, goodness of the average American people. Despite what's in the media, despite the rhetoric, um, I, 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 had, I was invited to sing at a Christian conference. And so I sing and I speak. And this old man comes up to me after, the, uh, after my session. Uh, and I always talk to people. And he said to me, you know, I was really compelled to come and listen to you, uh, knowing that you're going to speak about Islam. And after hearing you s s uh, sing and speak, my hate is gone, and he was crying. Because you know what, hate is an incredible, burdensome emotion. I don't think people want to hate. I do think that they're trying to they're grasp um, an alternative Islam, uh, a, a Muslim identity that they can believe in and not fear. We know that in systems of oppression and in environments of violence, those who historically have had less societal 